The Super Media Bros Podcast is a founding member of the Odd Pods Media Network. Super Media Bros. Yeah, I was telling the girlfriend, this is not the correct use of your band dam. Like, you get, like, two flickers of it. But for the most part, it's like, man, he is so much better when you let him be charming and affable and, and self-deprecating in particular. Absolutely. Like, this, he's just, I'm, I'm action man. <laughs> I, I do the action things. <laughs> I kick your ass. Sometimes, but not always. <laughs> because it's not that kind of movie. <laughs> Welcome to the Super Media Bros Podcast, where two best friends give comedically informative takes on movies, music, wrestling, and more. I'm Richie, and this week, my friend is not here. He is on vacation right now, uh, doing fuck all or whatever he's he's doing when he's when he's not at his day job or sitting across from me, uh, just humoring me mostly. Uh, this week, we are doing a cult cinema Saturday, and I couldn't do this alone. Like, I never want to do any of these alone because it's too fun to keep to myself. And fortunately for me, uh, I got a really good buddy who is into just as much like garbage ass shit as I am and is willing to actually do this. So that that says something if you're willing to come talk about this kind of shit. Uh, we are doing double team and I couldn't do it without my buddy Trevor from Catching Up on Cinema. How's it going, dude? Oh, that's fantastic, Richie. Thanks for having me. Happy to humor you and, <laughs> and share in the total fucking garbage cinema <laughs> experience. Yeah, dude. Uh, I've actually, uh, for those of you listening, uh, I've actually guested on Catching Up on Cinema with Trevor a couple of times in the past, but this is actually his first time hanging out with me on our show. So for those of you that are not familiar with the program, uh, Trevor, do you want to give them a hard sales pitch on you guys' uh, content? <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Richie. Uh, so yeah, my, my podcast is called Catching Up on Cinema, and that's kind of the concept. Uh, essentially, uh, a buddy and I, uh, we were looking for an excuse to stay in contact because he was moving out of state. And so I did the the very millennial maneuver of finding a project to keep up to like make us official friends. Like a- apparently I didn't have it within me to just say like, Hey, you want to be my friend? Like I had to, I had to have a scheme. <laughs> so I was <laughs> like, Hey, you want to come over and do a podcast? <laughs> it's like, Hey, you want to do a podcast forever? <laughs> <laughs> Does this mean we're friends now? <laughs> Did we just become best friends? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and that's essentially what happened. So it's a, we post literally every week. Uh, I don't think I've missed a week in like five years. Uh, and on top of that, I post a couple of extra episodes every month. Uh, one is called Tales from the Shelf, um, which is basically an excuse for myself and uh, my buddy Brad from the Cinema Speak podcast to talk about our respective uh physical media collections we have quite a lot of dvds blu-rays and 4k discs and so we share war stories about our collecting habit and whatnot Uh, and then the other one is catching up on blu-ray where we just talk about what's coming out uh each calendar month but yeah uh we do movie reviews uh we try to do deep dive analysis whenever possible um sometimes i just don't have it in me uh Case in point today would actually be a great example of a movie. I don't think I have it within me to do a deep dive on. (laughs) Right. And I was going to say to your point about physical media, it's something I have been preaching for a while. I I feel like between uh, music and movies, I've restarted my vinyl collection recently with music and I have what I feel like is a very extensive physical media collection of film. Like I love looking behind you and seeing just rows of film that speaks to me. I love just looking at, people's different collections and what they have. However, this movie will never fucking belong in my physical media collection. Yeah, I'm not surprised about that, Richie, but like we'll we'll get to the movie in just a second here. But I would like to say that like we have had you on for regular episodes, just talking about a movie or two, but I haven't seen your collection, but I know it exists. So I'd love to have you on for a Tales from the Shelf episode, uh, because that is also one of my favorite things. I I feel like you learn a lot about people based on I guess their motivations or their justifications for having the things that they have, like if they, if they exist, (laughs) because sometimes people don't have explanations for these things. Right. And I would love to do that because there's plenty to either deep dive or just glance over. Honestly, like I have everything from like 
really great, like what I consider to be great cinema to just fucking garbage. Oh, most of mine is garbage. That's I mean, straight yeah. up. <laughs> like I, um, I started collecting from uh, Arrow and Vinegar Syndrome and all these companies because I love that they go back and restore all these movies that were essentially lost for the most part or just never got their justice on physical media or theatrically, and it's it's fantastic. However, again, speaking double team, which is the film in question today, is not one of those movies, and I kind of hope it never does. <laughs> be so. If you've never seen Double Team, I feel like it is okay. There are elements of what a '90s action film would be, but in some other fashion, it's almost the antithesis of what a fucking '90s action movie is. It stars John Claude Van Damme, Dennis Rodman, and Mickey. I want my bird, Rourke. Which did not get billing at the top for fuck all. And he was probably the best fucking thing about this movie. It's, it's a 1997 action. It's labeled as an action comedy. And it was directed by Sui Hark, who is from Hong Kong. And this is his American debut as a director. And I, I'm, I'm sorry for that guy that this was his fucking American debut as a director. Because holy shit. Yeah, it, there's a lot of evidence pointing to Choi Hark's experience in Hollywood being just total fucking garbage uh he did not (laughs) he did not enjoy himself as far as i know like maybe all of his movies were van damme collaborations because i know knockoff was like the very next year and it also was not very good um it's actually kind of (laughs) it's kind of a race across the shit finish line which one is worse because neither is is particularly good maybe knockoff gets some more like dumb points or something uh but yeah this was during that that interesting period of Hong Kong and Hollywood film history where there was a, a mass exodus of talent from Hong Kong into, into the U S uh, just prior to the year 1997. Cause that's when the political handover from the British government to China occurred for that city. Um, and as a result, I think that it was a very turbulent time. It was a very uncertain time. So that's when like a few years prior to 1997, you saw John Wu was like the biggest name, uh, to arrive on U.S. shores, and he got busy. He got working. He got busy. He was probably the most successful, if I'm being honest. Yeah, and, and his movies were pretty fucking good, actually. I, li- I like a yeah. lot of his stuff. Yeah, for the most part, I, I like his American Fair. I think it. I think you get past the '90s, and it starts to dip pretty hard, though. Like, yeah. if memory serves, Paycheck is included in that, and uh, nope, don't nobody remember Paycheck. No, <laughs> like, that's the movie where uh, Ben Affleck twirls a staff in the trailer. And that's that's the money shot. Like that's how they're trying to put asses in seats. Ben Affleck <laughs> as a bow staff, a techno bow staff. I was gonna say the only you were like uh, nobody remembers paycheck. Ben Affleck remembers paycheck because he got a paycheck from it. So that's pretty much it. I mean, if he got I'm, a paycheck from it, <laughs> that's like the one memorable thing you can associate with paycheck is that is that joke? Because yeah, I'm sure I'm sure he still gets residuals for fucking paycheck. <laughs> God. <laughs> Imagine him getting in the mail and he's like, I forgot I was in this piece of shit. <laughs> you know, just, I mean, I'm sure J Lo's like flipping through the mail and she's like, she just starts cackling <laughs> <laughs> every time, like every month or every year. I wonder how she cackles. I wonder if she just kind of like does the Squidward kind of cackle. <laughs> <laughs> Or like an Ernest P. War, like a <laughs> yes. <laughs> God. God, I love Ernest. Uh. <laughs> but son of a bitch, man, this movie. Okay, so the plot is that Jean Claude Van Damme is a counter terrorist agent, but he kind of does a lot more fucking damage than some of the terrorists are doing in, in the opening of this. And um, his assignment is to get uh, Stavros, who is played by Mickey Rourke. And it kind of is unclear at first, like what the hell is happening? Because just in the notes that I took for this, which I barely do, but there was just so much fuckery that I I did not want to forget most of the shit that was happening. The label maker looking opening credits are what killed my ass. Like the, the movie has like neon green and blue shit, depending on what poster you're looking at. There's a lot of typical nineties fare on the front of this poster. But it looks nothing like that when the opening credits hit. Like I said, it looks like somebody took a label maker and just double team. Like, okay. And uh, (laughs) goddamn explosions galore right out of the gate. So I was like, okay, promising fucking start. But (laughs) but what the fuck is happening? (laughs) That's the yes. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> like this man is driving this giant and Jean Claude is just driving this giant ass truck. And there's a train that's crossing, and I'm like, he is, they are not gonna like tell us that this is gonna actually ramp over this train. Like, so when he went through one of the boxes and then landed, I was like, okay, that's a little better. Like, I, I would have shit myself if they actually launched it over the train. I was like, there's no way that's physically fucking possible. It's too heavy. Yeah, something worth drawing attention to is Richie used the word truck, air quotes, truck. Yeah. Th- this is a techno truck, if ever there was one. This looks like a vehicle from fucking Blast Core. If you remember that <laughs> Nintendo 64 game. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, but yeah, th- this this opening, and, and indeed, this is going to be an ongoing thing throughout this whole discussion. Unclear was another word that Richie tossed out there. Um, I actually took a picture of the uh, the Amazon Prime uh, like landing page for this movie because something that like I, I know this is a tangent but bear with me here Richie something that always makes me laugh is when I'm sitting on the couch with the girlfriend and she's flipping through movies and stuff on like Netflix and they have the keywords associated with the genre or the subgenre or the the vibe of the movie and this one the keywords associated with double team the way they're advertising this the way people are finding this movie is they're looking for suspense science fiction confused quirky <laughs> And no point does action <laughs> enter the picture. <laughs> Confused and quirky. <laughs> Those are the two perfect keywords. For this. I mean, I'm not saying it's a lie. It's accurate as fuck. It's just that's the that's what this movie is. Confusing and quirky. I can see it, though. I mean, it's 100 percent what is fucking happening throughout the entirety <laughs> of the hour and like over like an hour, 30 minute runtime where at one point, I was like, you know, they probably could have shaved about 25 minutes off of this motherfucker. Might have yeah, been. A- you mean like a huge chunk of the plot involving an island that didn't have to be there? <laughs> God damn, that was such a filler concept. It felt like leftovers from like an earlier draft or maybe even an entirely different script or maybe just an impulse buy on the part of, of someone in the production, like a producer being like, I really like that TV show, The Prisoner. Let's do The Prisoner. It's like we're. we're we're not doing the prisoner. It's a Van Damme action. It, we're doing the prisoner. We can I put paid. it. Yeah, we can put it in the middle. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> like <laughs> exactly. It's like the middle's gonna sag anyway. Let's make it extra soggy. Yes. So all this explosive bullshit happens, and then out of nowhere, it just it, south of France. Three years later, like what? what? Okay. <laughs> Which time jump? Absolutely. And we get introduced to. Jack Quinn in the form of him insulting his wife's deco art for being in his way when he's just walking around the house and he puts it outside by the pool and he gets yeah. promptly shoved into the pool by his, his wife, which good on her, dude, like what a dick. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is me making assumptions that I maybe shouldn't, but I would like to point out that I did say that this film is the product of a Hong Kong filmmaker for the first time working with an English speaking production company outside of his home, his own territory. Sometimes language barriers are, are kind of an issue on a, on a production. It, like it, it can, it can get in the way of things sometimes. And, and a lot of the blocking and the choreography of the sequence, like just the general skeleton of the relationship between these two characters felt like somebody's just like visual interpretation of what, like, a romantic relationship looks like it's like oh yeah this is what people do when they're in love like like they tease each other and they push each other into pools that they have and can afford (laughs) and they do art and things like that together like it it just felt like these are like bullet point things it's like yeah people will get that they're in love like they don't have to do any of that acting shit i don't have to tell them to do anything dude (laughs) I want to know where they fucking met. Like, they could not be more polar opposite people in terms of what they do. Like, the dude's like, I'm a counter-terrorist agent. (laughs) I'm an art deco person. It's like, where did you fucking meet? You know what I mean? Like, that's that's where I was sitting. I was like, how did they, uh, how, why, how? (laughs) Yeah, he's, like, racked up, like, MacGruber numbers in terms of, like, throats ripped out and stuff. And she's she's like, oh, I do art casually, you know. (laughs) Her friends are like, well, what does your husband do? Oh, you know, she has to, like, make up some bullshit because she doesn't want to tell him that he's, like, ripped, like, a thousand throats out or some shit. (laughs) He's like, they're like... 
don't know. They're sitting down to dinner and they're eating like lobster or something. He's just like, <laughs> like just like <laughs> ripping the thing apart, like, very really viciously. Like... <laughs> he's like, wow. always, he's always on edge and just doing everything very aggressively. Like even him like opening the door politely for her at a restaurant. It's him just like ripping the door like almost off the hinges and she just like, his first three fingers are just super muscular. <laughs> <laughs> His pinky skips leg day and shit. <laughs> you don't need that to rip a throat. No. <laughs> it's just extra. That's it. Yeah, it's for leverage, not for power. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but yeah, so she pushes him in, and then that, you kind of get some dialogue where you find out that she's pregnant, and they're going to have their you know first kid together. A, a former partner um, of Jack's shows up, just knows where he lives, and just shows up and explains to him that... Uh, Mickey Rourke's character of uh, Stavros is still alive because he got away, obviously. And, you know, just when he thought he was out. Driving his truck, you somehow didn't kill him. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. In all the midst of bullshit happening, that man is still alive. So just when he thought he was out, they pulled him right back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking of this guy, his dialogue is all atrocious and it's all real bad ADR. In fact, that that's like a constant thing throughout the movie. I noticed that too. The mixing didn't match up and neither did some of the dialogue with the lip movement. I was like, oh, what the fuck? Like, I know this yeah. dude speaks. Like, they couldn't just leave it in there? <laughs> yeah, I don't know exactly what the problem was. Like, I know like the Hong Kong film industry, I'm sure like they didn't use the same practices for this production, but like the Hong Kong film industry was notoriously late to the game in terms of integrating sync sound into their films. Yeah. So dubbing dubbing was just a constant presence. It was the norm. It was regular. I don't think that was the problem here. I think it was some sort of goof on the set or something. Like in particular, all the the dialogue between Rodman and Van Damme, it's from 1997, but it, God damn, it sounds like it's AI. Like it sounds like AI approximations of these two men speaking. It's it's bizarre. It has a weird tonality to it. I'm almost sure that that predated whatever the fuck AI writing is, because <laughs> not to skim over a bunch of shit, but to get to their dialogue. Essentially, like Jack is like, OK, I'll do this or whatever. And uh, the guy that recruited him back gets blown up in a car by Mickey Rourke, like whenever he's dropping him off and. You know, there's a lot of explosions in this movie and people walking away from explosions and a shitload of JCVD diving away in slow motion from explosions a lot, like a fuckload. But as soon as this happens, it just cuts right to some typical techno music. And I'm like, okay, this is exactly how we're going to get introduced to Rodman's character of Yaz, who is essentially uh, just Jean-Claude's arms dealer. And we get these weird dialogue. Obviously, this is the 90s, so... Jean-Claude is just looking at Yaz, you know, Jack looking at Yaz. He's like, who did your hair, Siegfried or Roy? And Yaz is like, well, the last guy who asked me that couldn't pull his head out of his ass. And in the most Tommy Wiseau-esque dialogue of this movie, JCVD, I don't want to know about your sex life. And I'm just thinking like, oh, by the way, how is your sex life? Like, that's the first thought that happened (laughs) when he said that. I was like, what the fuck? (laughs) Oh, hi, Yaz. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hi, Yaz. <laughs> so, uh, Jack, uh, let me uh, let me get you to my weapons cache, and we can start going over exchange. I, don't, I, I can't talk about that. That's confidential. Anyway, how was your sex life? <laughs> God <laughs> damn it. I did not push her into the pool. I did not do it. I did not. <laughs> oh, hi, Yaz. <laughs> oh, hi, Yaz. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Yeah, and that that whole exchange, uh, I guess, like it was just the way that they introduced his character because Rodman only really heavily shows up towards the back end of this film. He's he's just kind of there in the front portion and not at all really in the middle. And it's like the last I don't know maybe uh, I don't know half hours when he's really prevalent, you know, on camera. And surprisingly, he's he's sort of a natural, but he, you can tell he's a little stiff with his delivery. Like you can tell he's comfortable being on camera. And being shown off and shit because it's fucking Rodman, but I feel like if he if he did this if he had done you know any kind of like acting for maybe I don't know five six years before this he probably could have been like a much more worthwhile presence on screen because there's there was potential there I mean for fuck's sake the dude got into pro wrestling after this a little bit or this might have been right in the midst of him doing all the shit with Hogan and the NWO and everything 
Yeah, I, I want to say that timeline works out. That came right after. But yeah, he feels like maybe a little bit self-conscious. Like there's just like a lack of warmth in his performance. Right. Like he like he has good screen presence because he's fucking Dennis Rodman and he sticks the fuck out in any room you put him in. But it, I don't know. It would have been nicer if they didn't lean so much on the gimmick, I guess, of calling the movie fucking double team and putting both of them on the poster and then structuring the film in such a way that they don't even form said double team until very late in the game. And it's as inorganic as you can imagine. It's just like, I don't even know why these guys care about each other. Like it's never really made clear. Right. Cause at one point uh, later in the film, Van Damme essentially just was going to just kind of fuck him out of immediately paying him, even though he does, you know, repay his debts, as he says, it was like, okay, you don't give a shit, you know, at all. You're, you're willing to lie to this fucking guy. And let alone not tell him like actually what's going on, but you know, getting to that later, they set up another assassination attempt on um, Stavros at a carnival, and there was a line of dialogue. I'm kind of paraphrasing here, where um, Jack Quinn is pulled back in because he knows Stavros the best out of literally any person who has tried to track him down. He knows him like the back of his hand, and he tells this person, he's like, "Well, you got to have your eyes on him before he has them on you because he'll kill you essentially," and he locks eyes with him, you know, on target, but he refrains from taking any action because Stavros is there with his wife and his kid. And Quinn has kind of a change of heart because he's about to be a dad himself and all this other shit. So he hesitates to shoot him. And then all hell breaks loose at this fucking carnival. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Mickey Rourke, uh, Stavros shoots this chick who is the sniper through the fucking scope and into her head from what I caught on because some of this stuff moves a little fast. And this is coming from this chick who receives a weapon and says, quote, I can shoot the dick off of a hummingbird. And she got shot with a fucking hand pistol yards away through the eye scope through her skull. Okay. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> yeah. She gets very peppered essentially. Uh, if you've seen saving private Ryan, um, this, <laughs> This is the scene, Richie. So I'm a details man. Like that that's my thing. Is is finding the stupid little fucking details that absolutely ruin a film. <laughs> I, yeah, I've got a couple of them written down here too. Let's go for it. This is fantastic. This is the scene, I think, where where the movie tells you this this is going to get loud, it's going to get dumb and you're going to have no fucking clue why. <laughs> so just to just to toss some shit out there. This this entire action scene, it's like Aside from the truck chase in the beginning, kind of the first protracted action scene we get in the movie. And there has been a lot of goofiness up to this point to like signal you that this movie is going to get like Scooby-Doo fucking silly. <laughs> like, for instance, the, the weapons cache hidden yep. in the back is activated by a scuba stripper. Uh, <laughs> 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 That's how it gets opened is you have to. You have to tip the scuba stripper and then she hits a button on the wall of her scuba stripping tank and then it opens a secret <laughs> hidden passageway. It's that kind of movie. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. Anyway, in the amusement park, very important detail. We have a tiger in a cage. Yes. Put, a, put the biggest fucking pin in the world in that tiger. I mean, it's going to piss off that tiger. So maybe run after you do it, but definitely put a pin on. Yeah, him. that poor tiger, though. Goddamn. I know he got a raw deal, man. There, there's one stunt that that tiger was asked to do. I don't know if it was properly asked to do it. If I'm yeah. Being honest. Yeah. T poor Tony. He, he went from cereal <laughs> boxes to this shit. What the fuck? <laughs> uh, so we have a tiger here. We have a lot of confusion. Like I said, that's one of the key words used to advertise the film on Amazon. In fact, Phil uh, Collins wrote Land of Confusion based on this scene, like retroactively. <laughs> oh, my God. I love that song, by the way. Same. Um, uh, so the the big thing that like made me go, whoa, <laughs> this, I don't know if that was awesome or the dumbest fucking thing I've ever seen. <laughs> the way that Mickey Rourke, the way that Stavros gets the drop quote on a team of snipers surveying him is the tiger signals him. The tiger shoots energy in his direct. It uses like it, it aquamans him, but like. I don't know what the equivalent of that would be for land mammals. It's the eye of a tiger. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah, it shoots him the eye of the tiger. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> and the visual language of the edit goes like, whoosh. And so the tiger shoots a psychic message at Mickey Rourke. He has a kinship with the tiger. And it tells him he's being aimed at with a rifle. 
<laughs> and that's how he gets the drop on the sniper lady. Is the tiger told him? He's like, look out, Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> Very Scooby Doo as to Rook out, Ricky. <laughs> Rook out, Ricky. <laughs> oh, and then, then it just keeps going from there. So, like, Mickey and his goon squad, which is like hiding in plain sight, they all pull out their automatic weapons. It is the 90s. That's very much in vogue. This was the age of the automatic weapon in yes. action cinema. And everybody's getting killed. Uh, JCVD's team is mostly on the receiving end of the violence. And the whole time, again, I'm a details man, Richie. I'm just like, Mickey, your shoes, man. What What is up with your, your moon shoes, man? Did you see those kicks? What are those? <laughs> <laughs> what are those? That's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking, too. Was like, what is he wearing? Yeah, there are these giant white moon shoes that are unlaced, and, and they go past, they go up to, like, his shins. <laughs> it's terrible. And he's wearing blue jeans. <laughs> I want to know who the fucking costume design team for this movie was. Who made that decision? Who who's the final Coca Cola call? Corporation? They branched out into shoes. Dude, okay. So, sidebar on some of the shit I wrote down. It was one thing that stuck out more than anything to me. Like, first of all, Coca Cola has like prominent placement in this movie a couple times. This being one of them. At one point, mm -hmm. Quinn uh, Van Damme is running along the front of um, like a side carnival game a shitload of Coca-Cola cans just like spill out and roll, causing him to slip. Like he's like basically Hanna-Barbera Scooby-Dooing, slipping off of these fucking things, but he slips right into a perfect roundhouse kick delivery to whoever the fuck was next to him. I'm like, what the hell happened there? Like he goes from busting his ass. He's like, Whoa, just kicks him right in the face. I was expecting him to just completely biff it. And he just no, turns no, it right no, around. No, 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 no. See, see that, that's, that's a secret advertising tactic. See, by virtue of him slipping on that can, it enabled him to pull off the coolest kick in the movie. Ah. If that it, the Coke can with the assist, it's like the Dudley Death Drop. It's exactly, like, you, you got to have that launch, man. Like, like, <laughs> the Coke with the assist. That's it. It's an alley oop, if you will. Oh, 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 mm, mm. oh, oh. The first of how many to come? <laughs> God, a lot. <laughs> Fuck me. Oh yeah, and both of our hero, our hero and our villain have what I call super lock-on vision because the cinematography goes like into a POV shot and goes like, like just zooms in on torsos for bullets to be thrown at. So it's apparently a shared superpower between our our hero and our villain. Don't know why, but I guess it looks cool. And I I want to say that that was probably a huge motivation behind a lot of the construction of this movie is make it look cool. Like, do some silly shit with the camera, put some energy behind it. Doesn't matter if it makes sense or not, because I, the director, have no fucking clue what's going on. Don't ask me. I just work here. Right. <laughs> and not for very long, because I'm going to head back to Hong Kong in about a year. <laughs> and I'm going to forget I ever did any of this shit. <laughs> when I say the carnival scene is ass, I don't mean like, oh, it's so bad. Like, there is just bodies everywhere, dude. People are just getting fucking murked left and right. And but when they when they show up to the hospital, this is where I have the probably some of the most like shit written down. It's very quiet. Stavros is just walking around this place. There's a dead guy in an elevator door that just will not close because he's stopping it from closing. And with no context, I, I know you're going to understand because we both have seen this several times. Yeah. Without context. The following notes that I wrote down will not make any fucking sense. <clears throat> Mickey Rourke hates glass. That elevator guy, Jean-Claude Van Damme hates glass. <laughs> because, goddamn, if they're not punching glass window panes out or diving through them or shooting through them, so much glass is broken here by hand, bullet, or body. And it's completely unnecessary. I feel like they were just like, you know what? Fuck it. We got to tear this set down today. Fuck it up. <laughs> However you please just fuck it up. Pull the stunt guys <laughs> in here. Go nuts. Yeah, it, it is extraneous. Like glass city. Like they, they call police story. The end of police story. The, the house of glass sequence. Um, Love that there movie. it made sense. Like it heightened the drama and it has a glorious momentum to it and a focus to it. That this, <laughs> this scene completely lacks, but I'm so glad you pointed out the glass because the opening of the scene is just Mickey Rourke first breaking glass to like get to a security guard who he's already killed 
And then for no reason, he continues to break the glass around the guy. It's like, dude, he's already dead. Like, you, you want to kill him five times or something? Just yeah. make yourself feel like a big man or something? That's <laughs> but, it. But <laughs> I have a theory, though, that I was keeping track of the number of instances where Mickey Rourke is heard but not seen in this movie. Because no Mickey Rourke is notoriously difficult to wrangle. Uh, he's He has issues with Hollywood. He always kind of has. And I want to say a lot of it comes down to like feelings of like self-loathing or lack of self-worth. Like he he's a prickly fella is what I'm saying. Yeah. And it's a shame because honestly, like Rourke is to me, he's vastly underrated as an actor. I think he's fantastic. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. He he has a history of maybe not picking the best projects to use those talents. But every time he shows up like in earnest, like when he really applies himself, he's one of the best we got sometimes like, yeah. he's really great but i got a sense in this movie that maybe he was like limiting the number of takes he was allowing or something because he yeah. is off screen a lot a lot of his presence in the film is strictly voiceover and even in action scenes you get like flickers of him mm -hmm. and it's a little bit frustrating so to complete the thought maybe that extra footage of him breaking glass was him getting some stress out on the set like they just set up some candy glass and Mickey Rourke just went to town on it just because he was pissed off <laughs> and yeah. the cameras just happened to be rolling. Yeah, and dire <laughs> director was like, we got to use all this. It looks great. And it's like, okay, cool. And he's like, we, we need to fill time. All right. <laughs> just put a bunch yeah, of it's like, let's get some candid footage of Mickey Rourke breaking shit. <laughs> and, and maybe it's not even the takes. Maybe it's just him being pissed off with the direction. He's like, no, and just fucking punches through it. He's like, <laughs> and then, you know, and secretly Park's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's yes. just twiddling and stuff like, yes, <laughs> I get what I want anyway. <laughs> so, and then the other note that I have for this scene, and I shit you not, is who's watching these babies? Who the fuck is on duty watching these infant children in their fucking brand new baby boxes just sitting there shitting themselves all night with nobody around? And I know they shit themselves extra hard because of all the calamity happening in this moment. <laughs> Especially when Stavros puts a grenade in one of the baby's things with it in there. <laughs> and Quinn has to fucking yeet it behind him into the elevator because like, he's like, fuck that dead guy. He's already dead. And he goes to cart push it out of the way and just takes an ass ton of shrapnel to the back. The one, like first of many times that Van Damme is walking or diving or whatever in slow motion away from an explosion. I'm like, that's a hell of a plot twist that he's just going to get, you know, I knew he wasn't dead, but we're really going to put that much shrapnel in this man's back and fuck him up this early on. What else could they possibly be doing with this movie? God damn it. The colony. <laughs> the colony. <laughs> or the colonoscopy, either way, because this, this felt like a ton of shit. Really, I mean, it would be nice to be put under for for this part of the movie. Honestly, it, mm -hmm. it it comes out of left field. It has very little place in the film. Although, take that back a little bit. It does contribute the most memeable, or well, one of the most memeable moments in the entire film. So may, maybe it's justified being there. Yeah, I should preface this entire thing by mentioning that in the plot, he's taken away to this place, but. The rest of the world and his wife are informed that he has perished completely, like he's dead. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the catalyst for him ending up there. And this segment of the movie is essentially the, the television show The Prisoner, like, like straight up. Yeah, like you, you, if the Simpsons did it, I'll just say that much. <laughs> it's like it was that much of a cultural touchstone <laughs> that Simpsons did it. <laughs> so if you've seen that episode of The Simpsons and you haven't seen The Prisoner, you, you know what we're talking about. So the colony is what is uh, labeled as an invisible penal island for the secret agents. And it's all kinds of secret agents. Uh, they've interacted with each other. Hell, some of them have turned on each other as apparent by Van Damme waking up, realizing where he's at. He's, he knows what the fuck it is, obviously. We, we really don't know what it is, but by his reaction, it's not good. Where they're just like, you've been assigned to the colony. And he's just, no, like, he's so fucking angry. And they're like, press your thumbprint here if you want to live. Because they're essentially just uh, assigned to uh, give their intelligence over, you know, different terrorist threats that they're analyzing. And um, they're registered like an entire fucking, you know, colony, for lack of a better word, because that's what they're going to just. Oh, we're just going to call the colony. We can't think of anything else cool. Just fucking call the colony. 
but he's pissed about it and he's limping around on crutches and he's bandaged up and shit. And he comes across this swimming pool where I guess one of his old comrades, he knows he fucked this guy over. This guy fucked him over one of the two because he just, he goes to shake his hand and he just gets a right hook to the face, just real, real hard. And it's like, okay. I, I mean, it was, it was Van Damme in his Coke days. I wouldn't be surprised if this was a common occurrence. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Let's go to a pool party. <laughs> some, <laughs> some guy that you wronged in some fashion just says, you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I fuck a lot of guys. <laughs> I was doing Street Fighter, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I spent most of my nights with Kylie Minogue. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame him at that point. Jesus Christ. I can't get her out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. So the whole time that he's in here, Catherine obviously got informed that he's, you know, he's dead, but he's not dead. And the way they go about kidnapping her is they call her in the middle of the night to tell her that she's been accepted for this um, gallery, like art showing for her, her work or whatever. And she's just sitting there like sobbing and just listening on the phone to this. And then she's like, yeah, I guess I'll do it. And it's like, I would be too uh, inconsolable to do fuck all. It, it, this yeah. is where the movie gets real, like stupid in my opinion, like until it picks back up, there's a, just a real dip. Yeah. Th this is kind of where it gets real soggy. But th this this scene, just just to build it out a little bit. Again, remember, this is my theory of the director is that he, he really doesn't have an understanding of the material because it's probably incomprehensible on paper as it is. It's mm -hmm. just like, let's just give it a vibe. Let, let's try to project the feeling that that'll somehow latch on to people and make them understand what's going on. So he has like her walking out in a white dress in the rain and going to sit in the pool in her dress without disrobing and that's to signal she's sad you understand correct this is how people experience sadness right <laughs> and then she comes in and she's still soaking wet and the phone happens to be ringing she picks up she's like hello, <laughs> hello. <laughs> I can't tell if it's tears or water from the fucking pool because she can't cry on camera <laughs> Well, also, the actress probably doesn't know what she's being asked to feel. Right. She's like, I'm wet and I'm cold. I'm going to I'm going to hold on to that. I'm going to I'm going to channel that. I'm miserable and <laughs> not sad. Miserable. Her agent was probably actually on the phone during this take. She's like, I can't do this shit anymore. Give me something better. <laughs> Well, it doesn't help, too, that not to be mean and be a dumb American about it, but like this woman's accent, she is speaking English throughout the entire film. She's French. But the whole time I'm listening to her, I'm I'm getting flashbacks of Heavyweights, the Disney movie. Oh, it's my like, God. Yes. Wh where are you from? And she just looks you dead in the eyes and says, far away. Because <laughs> 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 really, it's just like, I don't know what this accent is, but I can tell she's really having to reel it in. Anyway, she picks up the phone. She's like, hello. And they're like, hello, miss. We would love to buy your really ugly sculptures. <laughs> and she's just like, oh. And like immediately at the drop of a hat, she's like, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> like all her problems just disappeared in that moment, dude. Yeah, her dress just dries up. And she's like, oh, that's great. <laughs> I'll pack my bags. I'll just pick up my shit and move to Rome overnight. <laughs> My husband got blowed the fuck up six months ago, <laughs> <laughs> saving a baby. <laughs> Speaking of which, that scene in the hospital, like, Choi Hark had the pull. He could have brought Chow Yun Fat in for a cameo, just like walk in on the babies and just be like, oh, oh I'll come back. <laughs> it's like, you, you guys got some shit to work out. I'll be back. <laughs> Call me when the building's on fire. <laughs> shit. <laughs> so, yeah, he is there for months at a time, you know, on the colony. But we we get one of the fucking most unintentionally hilarious moments uh, in the whole movie where Van Damme is showing off like, I can stretch. I'm very flexible. This is how I'm going to recover. I'm just going to hang out in this doorway and just climb it and flex really hard because he plans to escape by air. This colony has um, water drop offs where a an airplane will come down essentially and just hook onto the, um, the cargo and fly off with it. So his plan is to just get off of the island that way. 
but there is a laser grid thing that is in the ocean that we learn later will fucking just explode you. So nobody wants to be exploded underwater. It's a hell of a way to go. But the unintentionally hilarious thing that we're uh, referring to is when he decides, you know, I'm going to fill this tub with water and I'm going to just going to lift it. It's a freestanding tub. He's just going to lift it with a chain around his neck. But goddamn, Jean-Claude, goddamn. Man, he looks like he's fucking this bathtub real, real hard. Yeah, I hope you pull some audio from that sequence, Richie, because it is it is spectacular. Like this is this is primo meme shit. Like this is straight tub tub fucking. <laughs> the angles, the choreography, the glistening. The man is glistening. He's oiled up. He's invigorated. <laughs> the facial expressions, the thrusting, Richie. My the, God, the, the thrusting, the moaning, everything. Yep, the moaning, and he cha- he changes positions a little bit. He changes yes. his game mid game, like like he puts his hands behind his head, and he he's like, I don't need my arms. I could do the whole thing with with just my pelvis. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> Chumbawamba ain't got shit on me. Tub thumping, I'm tub fucking. <laughs> God. <laughs> That's this probably going to savage tub fucking in cinema history. Yeah. That... <laughs> well, aside, aside from maybe, uh, what is it? Showgirls, but that's more pool fucking. Yeah. And that's fucking in a pool, not fucking the actual apparatus. Yeah. Like fucking the actual pool. That's a damn fine <laughs> cup of coffee. <laughs> He's really going after her Twin Peaks there, buddy. Oh, yeah. Mm. And, and yeah, that's definitely how, how our human anatomy lines up that's right. that's definitely how high you want the gal on she, you know she knows roughly that, on your nipples <laughs> she knows that's his belly button right <laughs> hey speaking of the room yeah exactly <laughs> yep. side by side comparison there like I, they went to the same school they 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 come from the same school of of kung fu pool fucking <laughs> yes <laughs> But the music also heightens it too. Like the music is not helping. The background music is just. Speaking of music, uh, something I, I like to pay attention to when it comes to movies is the scores yes. uh, in particular. Um, and this is done by Gary Chang, uh, who I'm not super familiar with, but you don't have to be super familiar with him because he basically repeated himself uh, from the, the one other score I know him from. And that is Under Siege. He did the first Under Siege. And. The theme in that one goes dun, 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 and the theme in this one is basically the same. It, it's like it's vanilla ice. It's a ding, ding, yeah. ding, 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 ding. <laughs> it has a little ding there. We have the a little end. extra ding in there. <laughs> it, it's very, very, very similar material. But I do love the flourish of virtually every time Stavros's name is said in the film, there's a <laughs> like there's an electric guitar going <laughs> it's almost it's almost South Park-esque, really. <laughs> it's so cheesy, but I, I kind of love it, yeah, actually. Yeah, me too. Uh, so, uh, to cut through some of the shit to get to his escape, he's doing an analyst thing for another terrorist, and he gets a message from Stavros, who obviously knows he's here, that he's got his wife, and he's just, okay, now I really got to get the fuck off this island. <laughs> So after his training, you know, his self-training, he, uh, he slices the uh, tip of his finger, like his fingertip skin off and places it on the scanner. That way it just fools the whole thing into thinking he's still there. My man dives off of this cliff into the water. He's attacked by Scuba Steve, who is like, Scuba you're, Steve, yeah, yeah, yeah you. exactly. He's like, you're, <laughs> you are not getting off of this island, motherfucker. So... He eventually like wins that over and escapes from the cargo getting picked up by the plane. And this is where like Scuba Steve is is the one that's exploded underwater. And the the face that he just <laughs> just blows up. <laughs> it's just so it's so great. I think that's where the comedy has come from too. Because nothing in this movie that is written to be intentionally funny is actually funny. The shit that's not supposed to be funny is fucking hysterical. Accurate, <laughs> very accurate. And I, I had written right here, like in my notes, I said, 43 minutes into the movie and we still haven't gotten into the bulk of the actual plot. And we're 43 minutes in. Uh-huh. Fuck. 
yeah, we do quite a lot of, as the Brits would say, faffing about. Mm. <laughs> the little scuttle that Yaz and Quinn have whenever Quinn just shows up months later, finds Yaz, and he's just like, hey, I, I need gear. And he's like, no. And they just they just scuffle like a little bit until they fall through the door. And then Yaz like giggles it off, and he's like, uh, yeah, c- come on in. Okay. Yeah. What the fuck? I, I, again, that... I, that- that reeks to me of foreign filmmaker. It's like, yeah, this is how people make friends, right? They, they wrestle and then they're friends. <laughs> it's like they throw each other through plate glass windows and then they're friends. Yeah. <laughs> Look, guy, the last time I saw somebody get tossed through a plate of glass and they stayed not friends was when Shawn Michaels threw Marty Jannetty through the fucking barbershop window. Okay. <laughs> Take some notes. Yeah, just- Take some notes. Yeah, you know, only one of the most traumatic moments in, in that period of wrestling history. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, they're not friends anymore. <laughs> oh no, the I rock- can't trust anyone anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the rockers are no more. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> so um, Quinn promises that he's gonna pay Yaz uh, with. CIA bank account access like he's like I got I have a ton of account access for CIA and it's like okay I mean I would I would think that would sell anybody on wanting to help but at this point it's like do you really think that he's got all this stuff after he's been kidnapped by the very people that you know he's kind of fucked over in some aspects like no all that shit he had is pretty much just null and void you know but the way they get to his house, because he's like, I got to get to my house and all this other, they fucking skydive to his house. That was an awkward scene, too. I, I want to also point out uh, the amount of hair color changes that Rodman has had from scene to scene by this point. I lost count. I, I know that f- there's at least five from, you know, what I had seen. But they go from the weapons cache to the skydiving thing, and the hair color is different from that scene to that. And you would have to think that's had to have been at least within 24 hours of, of, of the meeting. I'm just picturing him saying like, whoa, 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 time out, buddy. I got to I got to fix my hair. Right. <laughs> it's like, I know you have a ticking clock what, with your, your wife and your baby, but my hair, I got to it's got to look fine before I get out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's got to look fly before I fly, buddy. <laughs> yeah, th- This whole sequence just I this was where maybe I tuned out a little bit, which is extraordinarily rare. I, I can I can key in on the stupidest bullshit. Like, I, I I will focus if I have to for research purposes. Yes. Um, but this scene, I was like, what? To to quote Tom Hardy from The Dark Knight Rises, I was like, why are you here? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like like why are we here? What are we doing? And I <laughs> didn't quite figure it out. I think he just wanted to check on his wife or something. But the fact that like Rodman goes with him, it's like what. What, should, should, what, what are we doing? And then, and then they have basketball-shaped parachute things that that have the basketball striping pattern oh on my them. God, yeah, well, yeah, that's bad. Yeah, and <laughs> they they show up here and just get fucking ambushed because Stavros' men are already there monitoring the situation because they have his wife and he doesn't really, you know, it's like hey, they have my wife, but I'm gonna go home. Yeah, maybe she's there. It's like. No, he, he wants to check on. He's like, I have to check on my Pokemon cards. <laughs> <laughs> <They're> very valuable. <laughs> yeah. Make sure the wife didn't sell them already. <laughs> dead for six months. You don't understand. <laughs> the jar is art. It appreciates. <laughs> and she left the internet logged in and I've lost all my AOL hours. I need to log out. <laughs> that shit costs money. <laughs> so, fuck. <laughs> Oh God! But they get there, and this is this is where I had the note written down of like, how many times is this man gonna jump away in slow motion from an explosion? Because the house, yeah. the house fucking blows up, the pool blows up, other shit blows up, people are blown up, blown away by guns. How, yeah. how did and they survive? How the fuck did these two get out of there? Really? I mean, I don't think we survived that crash, man. <laughs> no oh, shit! <laughs> he just shoves um, him out of the plane. <laughs> I'm gonna kill you as he's falling. God. 
And funny enough, that's like one of the only moments of levity I picked up from from Van Damme in this movie, from Jack Quinn's character, because he's weirdly stone faced in this movie, Van Damme. It's very frustrating. But like when he gets his ankle like caught on his parachute and he gives like a little like, <laughs> like, yeah. like, like you can tell he's flustered. It, 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 it's very affable. Like that's the Van Damme that I appreciate right. and want more of in the these kinds of dumb movies. But yeah. he's just weirdly deathly serious through most of this movie. But there is a rule of thumb in the choreography of almost every gunfight in this movie. And that's that Van Damme's stunt double has to do some sort of flip prior to shooting somebody. <laughs> it, 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 it's just like shot reaction shot. But every time we cut back to Van Damme, he's doing some sort of acrobatic maneuver and then he shoots somebody. <laughs> I'm just picturing like if you did like a master shot, and it's like some guy like frantically reloading while Van Damme's like break dancing for yeah. like ten seconds and then shoots the guy. <laughs> it's like I just need to style on everybody before they go down. <laughs> I need your last moments to be that painful. <laughs> you got served. <laughs> you got served. Yeah, dude. <laughs> it's like you need to know that I'm more handsome, more limber, more athletic. Oh yeah, and you're dead. <laughs> God damn but it. There, there's some wonkiness here where it, like the the fake nanny lady there's some sort of thing going on here where yeah. she gets like a extra special death and he like closes his eyes before he shoots her as if he's not wanting to do it it's like motherfucker she planted the bomb no she's shit. been shooting at you the whole time she is the most deadly person here why are you hesitating <laughs> He probably didn't want to because he's like, I can't believe she betrayed. Hey, everybody betray me. <laughs> you know everybody I mean? betray me. <laughs> <laughs> so he fucking didn't want to do it, but he had to. And he's like, uh, I don't want to shoot a woman, but fuck it. He just fucking blows her away. <laughs> everybody betray me. I fed up with this girl. <laughs> just kills her ass. God. <laughs> Hey, this is Grab and Brisket Podcast. Join us every Monday where we talk about the latest trends in barbecue, interviews with world top pit masters, celebrity cooks. Ooh, like uh, Wee Man from Jackass. And musicians. Like Rich O'Toole. So check us out. We do beer reviews, barbecue fails. So many fires. Dude, a lot of people just burn their houses down for no reason. We also talk about cocaine hippos versus meth gators. Learn how to make some tailgate gravy. Altercations with Texas Rangers. People throwing Reese's peanut butter cups. Yeah. So check out grabthebrisket.com for podcast info, viral social media posts, and so much more. I think this is where um, he gets another message from Stavros where he's like, no, he got to come to Rome. It's like, what? It just flew and dropped in on my fucking house three hours south of France. Like, I really got to go to fucking Rome, Italy now. Okay, fuck it. So He lucked out. He lucked out this was 1997 Mickey Rourke, because if it was like, I don't know, 2016, 2018 Mickey Rourke, it would go, it's like, I didn't get that. It's like the tape keeps repeating. He's just like, I don't understand. I don't know what your goal is. Dennis Rodman, do you speak Mickey Rourke? <laughs> because I don't. <laughs> Hang on, let me call Stallone. Maybe he knows. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> the, and then Stallone and Rourke just mumble at each other for the <laughs> remainder of the phone call until no, one of the he, phones he, he dies. He holds the phone up to the, the tape, and yeah. he's like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what he's saying. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. So they cut over to Italy and the car that Rodman hot wires, his head sticking out. If, if, am I like remembering this right? His head sticking out of the top of it. Yeah. Like a goddamn giraffe. <laughs> I in the train know. Car. It's... <laughs> we have to accentuate that Rodman is, what was he like? Six foot nine. Like we have to accentuate that this man is fucking tall <laughs> and he's, you know, he's going to hot wire this car, but he's going to just stick his head out the top of it. Richie. Fat guy in a little coat. Yes. Tall guy in a little car. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they're equally funny. They're they're absolutely not. <laughs> the only thing that would have made this even funnier is if they put one of those little wind up things on the back of it. Oh yeah. yeah. Like he has to like steal that from the guy. <laughs> yeah, but he has to get out and like wind it before he gets back in and goes. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, this is a real crank. And he fucking like <laughs> cranking that bitch up. Why did you steal toy car? Like <laughs> fucking <laughs> Speaking of which, I, again, I, I love my details. Yes. Uh, my favorite was um, 
Air Force One, Richie. Do you love that film like I do? It's, I love that film. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good one. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it has its moments. It's not amazing, but it's good enough. Yeah. Uh, Harrison, anytime Harrison Ford punches, people puts a smile on my face because it just looks so awkward uniquely awkward yeah and it has the most glorious sound effects backing it so it's this this weird juxtaposition of just like that's the worst form i think i've ever seen but the most epic sound i've ever heard yeah dude you just fucking you know and you're like, what? <laughs> there was there, there was no fucking way that that much force was was it's behind like, I think it. that that motherfucker just like fell into me fist first i think he hurt himself more than me <laughs> that motherfucker hit me with another motherfucker just said <laughs> just fucking punch the shit out of him dude that's why <laughs> <laughs> and then three hours later, you just hear dude falls the God. Fuck over. <laughs> God damn. And, anyway, Air Force One, uh, a little Easter egg that always made me laugh. And I could be misremembering this, but when I was young, I remember when Gary Oldman gets on the plane, his press pass says six foot. And I was like, hey, no way. <laughs> Great security team. Right. <laughs> Gary Oldman, six foot. Uh, Van Damme in this, his ID says 5'11". And I'm like, ah, ha, 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 pretty sure no, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he can fit in a Fiat just fine. <laughs> so when they get to Rome, uh, this is when Jack Quinn tells Yaz that the bank accounts that he's promised him are completely empty and he's got nothing that he can pay him except for a promise to repay his debts. But he receives this uh, manila folder at the drop-off point and it's a sonogram of the baby. And that's when Yaz like takes the picture. He's like, well, why didn't you say anything? Because wouldn't you think that'd be pertinent information to this entire fucking ordeal? It's like, dude, this guy's got my wife, a pregnant wife, you know, my unborn son or daughter or whoever. And, you know, at that point, Rodman's like, I don't need your money. Like he's going to help him just completely on moral support. And it's like, could have avoided all this bullshit just by being like, hey, dude, so I'm um, kind of in a rough spot. Uh. You know, kind of. I guess in a way that kind of spoke to how the character of Quinn viewed Yaz is that like he's just kind of this arms dealer that doesn't give a fuck about anybody but himself. But you know, um, Yaz's character is surprisingly um, sympathetic and empathetic in some ways towards his character, and that doesn't ever really get touched on more so than this one particular scene. And, and, but it's not like Rodman could really convey it more than like Rodman could convey it. Uh, by giving him a fucking basketball pep talk. Something, something defense, something, something get off the bench, something, something offense. What would make the movie 5% better is if every time Rodman did a basketball pun, which is, you know, about 60% of his dialogue, well, just look into the fucking camera. Just, <laughs> just break the fourth wall. Yeah, just break the fourth wall. Just do it. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> and then put a, put a little digital ting. Like, like a sparkle tooth, yeah. on his tooth or his eye, either one or both. <laughs> <laughs> Ding. Uh, just and then after a while, you just see the Michael Jordan one pop. Stop it! Get some help. <laughs> Get some help. Get some help. <laughs> and oh my God, can we talk about the fucking disguise that that Jack Quinn is wearing when they are going to this other point to uh, meet or not meet, but they're kind of you know spying on Catherine being in the backseat of this car and Stavros's men are all in this, this courtyard area. Dude, Rodman is looking just decked out in a full ass suit, fucking hat, new hair color, like the whole nine. My man's went all out for Rome, Italy. Like, like you're supposed to. Van Damme is rocking a fake nose piercing in this longer curly hair and he's got a jam box on his shoulder fucking bobbing his head and then Rodman sits next to him and he just turns it off and then just like, so what do we do now? I was like, oh God. Yeah, it's it's a terrible disguise. Uh, both of them sitting seating next to each other is even worse because, like you said, Rodman is so dapper, and they're they're like surrounded by like goth folks and stuff. Yep. So like neither of them fit in with the people that they're with. Neither of them fit in with each other. They stick the fuck out. <laughs> but, they really do. But Van Dam's is just feels like he. I don't know. He spun around real fast and got pushed into the into the costume department because none. It's incomprehensible. It's not cohesive. His he, outfit. In fact, yeah. my note says he looks like the human job of the hut from the outtake footage from A New Hope. Oh God, he's got the, he's got the furry fucking vest <laughs> that he wears for roughly forty percent of the fucking movie for some oh, reason. No, he fell into the costume department like he fell into the swimming pool at the beginning of the movie. 
he looks like he should be palling around with the Roma guys who took Jerry Seinfeld's dinner coat. <laughs> <laughs> and he just won't take that damn vest off no. for some reason. I, really... I think he brings it into the final battle and he only takes it off just before they start hitting each other. He, it's he, like he does. about fucking time, man. Yeah. That was your disguise, not your hero uniform. He, he probably put it on. He's like, I really like this fur. <laughs> Just like I mean, it. I wouldn't put it past him. Van Damme is an odd duck. Like, like he he loves anachronisms and stuff. Like, he likes kind of. I mean, maybe that's why they put him with Rodman because they both kind of have that flair of of sticking out like that. Like yeah. Van Damme, I mean, it, it says a lot that like his, the first movie he directed, if like he's only done a couple, was The Quest, and it's a period film where everybody's wearing kind of fanciful costumes because it takes place in a different a different place in a different time. So he's very much down for this kind of stuff. But I wouldn't be surprised if maybe he had a hand in picking this outfit. <laughs> and uh, maybe it was a self-soothing thing, like you say. Like in between takes, he just liked putting his index finger and his thumb together, rubbing the fur, and he's like, in my happy place. <laughs> <laughs> he's, like, he just, he's just stemming between, so he's like, oh, this feels so good. Is this, yeah. is this real fur? <laughs> <laughs> what is that velvet it's beautiful vortex <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> just fumbling completely uh on the intelligence factor here where he sees her in the car he sees Catherine, and even rodman is just like oh that's what they want you to do and he's just like you know slow-mo running after her, Catherine. it's like oh you do you were dead fucking giveaway well, I mean, that's also the point in the movie where, sure. you know, the tr the trained anti-terrorist agent should be looking Rodman dead in the eyes and saying, how do you know that? <laughs> right. I'm, I'm the secret agent. <laughs> you are the arms dealer. <laughs> yeah, like, how do you know more than me, motherfucker? Yeah, it's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Why am I listening to you? <laughs> your name is, your name is Yaz. <laughs> Short for what? I don't think you know. <laughs> Short for yes, bitch. So he's, <laughs> he's fucking he, he runs after her. This and, scene, Richie. Jesus this Christ. scene. We, we gotta we gotta detail this because th this is on par with the amusement park in terms of just the amount of sheer chaos that yeah. unfolds. Yeah, because I put uh Jesus Christ, this is a massive shootout in in all like caps, broad daylight. And fuck, dude, there's like more families and more innocent casualties in this entire thing too it's wow yeah and i defy you to tell me who is on whose side during this exchange people are just shoot like, like they were just apparently this was just a gathering of people looking for a fucking excuse yeah. <laughs> because i don't know i don't know the motivations for any of the shooting i just know a lot of fucking people are getting shot director fucking straight up goes action and everybody's like what do we do action <laughs> if any of you are are still alive by the time the camera stops rolling i would be deeply upset <laughs> you didn't do your job <laughs> but yeah we have snipers we have a wedding happening parallel to this which i get i yeah. get it that's like a hitchcockian or like a de palma-esque like tension building thing where yeah. there's like some other industry like innocent activity that just happens to be going on in the environment that we, would, the viewer should be concerned about. I would go with De Palma on that. Just a quick sidebar yeah. because of the whole bombing scene in Scarface when Pacino has yeah. a change of heart with the family there. Exactly. Yeah. So this is like, no, no, no. I said no, I said no kids, you cockroach. <laughs> uh, that guy, that the guy doing the bombing, he pops up in the damnedest places. Right. He's just got that kind of face. Like, I, I hate to say it, but it's like he was well cast. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we got a wedding. We got snipers. There's a man on a horse with a cape, Richie. Oh, wow. He has a goddamn cape. <laughs> and he has a submachine gun on a horse. <laughs> Fuck. This is like right out of the Dark Knight Returns comic. <laughs> yeah. Batman shows up riding a horse. That's Why? Because it. it's you. awesome. Because fuck oh. you. I'm Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the goddamn Batman. That's that's right. <laughs> I'm the Van Damme Batman. That's why. Fuck you. <laughs> oh my God. Belgian Batman. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> This scene's fucking outrageous, though. Yeah, just bullets flying everywhere. At, at some point, uh, there's not a man on fire, unfortunately, but um, there is repelling, and uh, Van Damme jumps on a runaway horse to try to save the bride from the wedding, and 
And my note just concludes with the word Jesus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Funny enough, yours conclude with Jesus. Mine start with Jesus. It's like, Jesus Christ, this is a massive shootout in broad daylight. Jesus. Book ended by Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so uh, Quinn winds up tracking uh, Stavros' sniper, and uh, he follows him up into this hotel how is this man, again, you know, questioning this kind of shit is just, I shouldn't be. Uh, how is he firing off rounds out of this, what looks to be a guitar case, but it's actually just a case that fires off rounds? Okay. He's holding like a really loosey goosey handle, but no trigger, well, no nothing. Well, Richie, you already know this, but maybe some of your listeners don't. Desperado was a movie that happened. Yep. El Mariachi was a movie that preceded it, mm-hmm. that was also very successful. They were kind of, a big deal. Absolutely. Fuck that is all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> love those movies. Yeah, we all do, Rich. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Except for that third one. I'm not a huge fan of that one. Yeah. Yeah. But but yeah, Desperado. Desperado was kind of cool. And you know, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody saw that movie. Maybe somebody who worked on this movie and was just like, hey, you know, why not? He's got a guitar case to conceal his rifle. Let's just turn that rifle into an automatic one and keep it in the guitar case just for funsies. And yeah. To to the credit of the film, this is like the standout action scene, if you ask me. Like this hotel scuffle, I thought was pretty well executed. Yeah, it was really cool. And um, I, I want to just kind of keep the whole like oddball weaponry going because as the scene progresses and he's jumping around the stairwell, dodging these bullets, he eventually tackles them into this suite where it's revealed they've been keeping Catherine, but obviously she's not there anymore. This man kicks his fucking shoes off uh, very uh, bro style. He very Matt Riddle's. You know, throws his fucking <laughs> his slippers at Van Dam, only to reveal that he is footing. I, I am emphasizing footing a uh, pocket knife that he's just gonna like keep at his toe, and like I'm gonna stand up and hold my foot up, and I'm gonna slice and dice you with my foot. It's fucking, yeah, fucking wild. Yeah, you know, in, in in other spy movies, generally you just tap your shoe, and the knife comes out of the shoe. You keep your shoes on, you know. But uh, no, this guy, he, he's he's method. Like He's like, no, I, I need to I need the tactile feel of a knife gripped by my my toes. Yeah. And yeah. And yeah, he holds it up to Van Damme's face. It's kind of it's deliberately silly as far as I can tell. Um, but for what it's worth, the, the choreography and the execution of the scene is pretty well. It in particular, the editing like is not great throughout the whole movie. But Troy Hark seems to have a very good handle on how to shoot and edit Van Damme. Because Van Damme, fluidity has always been kind of his issue with his martial arts performances. He's got the form. He's got the flexibility. He can do really nifty poses. And he's got the flexibility and like the athleticism to do the aerial kicks and stuff. But he needs an editor to like step up the pace and make it more fluid because yeah, there he's... are... He's There's stiff. beats in between his move. Yeah, he's he's kind of stiff, especially if you put a knife in his hand. Sure. That's one of the funniest fucking things you'll ever see in cinema. Because he, he does this, like like he's he like it offering yeah. it. It's like he's offering an ice cream cone to a chimpanzee <laughs> or something. <laughs> you take it from me. <laughs> like, he's like, you're going to take the knife. <laughs> Come on, monkey. <laughs> Come on, let's dance, monkey. <laughs> But on the subject of action, though, um, I would like to point out a couple of really surprising credits that I wasn't aware of until I started to run the credits for the movie. Like I, I was diddling my notes or something when the credits were rolling. <laughs> um, Samuel Hung uh, is credited as one of the choreographers on the film. Um, he and Troy Hart go way back, so that makes a lot of sense. And also Samuel Hung, like started to branch out into into the West. I mean, fucking martial law was was a a staple of American television for a while. They had a fucking crossover with Walker, Texas Ranger. Yeah. Sambo hung was on your TV. If you cared to watch him. Um, but yeah, he's, he's a legend of, of action cinema. He's one of the best choreographers that's ever been. And he worked on this movie of all things, probably just doing a solid to a buddy yep. uh, in the form of the director. And then a uh, Cyril Raffelli, uh, appears as a, I think he's a stunt double or just a stunt man in the credits. And uh, he's he's from uh, District B-13. He's like one of the earliest practitioners of parkour. And a lot of this film was filmed in France. So that makes sense. But I was like, holy shit, like talk about guys who weren't on the map yet, but 
taking bumps for <laughs> on behalf of guys like Van Damme and stuff, making them look like a million bucks uh, before <laughs> we knew who they were. Speaking of goofy weapons, though, Richie, there, there was one more brought out that looks like I know what it's supposed to be, but it looks like an exercise device that you would use to to like stretch your pecs. Yeah, the tension, <laughs> the, those uh, tension springs or whatever they're called, yeah. man. Oh my <laughs> god! Because I couldn't make out what they were at first when it when, yeah. when he pulled them out. I was like, "Is this Wolverine? What the fuck's happening here?" And he's just like, <laughs> <"Trust."> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> "Shit!" Uh, he strong arms his way out of that little ordeal and um that scene wraps up nicely with uh, Catherine being taken into a hospital and prepped for delivery. Man, the way they're rolling her in, it looked like um, Halloween curse of Michael Myers when they're rolling. Um, well, it was supposed to be Daniel Harris, but rolling uh, the strode knees like through the fucking hospital. And it's like, where are you taking me? Who are you people? <laughs> like the fact that like, you know, Catherine's just like, who are you? It's like, do you really give a shit who these people are? They're going to fuck you over either way. Like, I don't want to know who the hell they are. <laughs> it's like the, the proper response to that is, well, that would depend on what cut of the film it is, ma'am. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I'm partial. To, I am partial to the producer's cut. If we're being honest, so. I could tell you. But we're not in that cut of the film. <laughs> so just pretend I'm not here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, she's she's taken there. And uh, we cut over to where Quinn is going to try to get help from some monks. And the, the, the monk that answers the door strikingly resembles Tobin Bell from certain, like, angles. He does. He kind of sounds like him too. Yeah, like with a with kind of a light Italian accent. But yeah, I, I had the same impulse. Yeah, and I was like, "What the fuck is this? Is he here to play a game? Like, what the fuck's going on?" And uh, so he goes in there, and it turns out that um, he finds out that they are quote cyber monks, because Yaz has equipped this entire place out with all kinds of internet and computer gear, and Rodman just in there with all these motherfuckers and. Quinn shows up looking very surprised to see him. He just, what's up? And then without missing a beat, all the monks in unison, what's up? I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> they start dropping uh, lingo and all kinds of shit. And I'm like, oh my fucking God, we're really doing this. <laughs> I don't know why I expected less. Yeah, I I would have loved to have seen a different cut of this movie. No, actually, that's not true. I, I don't <laughs> care to see a different cut of this movie. <laughs> but if I was to rearrange it a little bit, I would just nix the colony and bump up the profile of the cyber monks because f they're fucking cyber monks. And not only that, they're, they're, they're set. Their lair is actually kind of cool. It's a neat little like Roman bat cave. Like, like it has a catacomb look to it, but it also has like that, that very common, like cyberpunk uh, spire of monitors and wires all strung around. Like it's actually kind of a neat set. And yeah. these guys are affable. I mean, what's up? Like that that's unexpected. It's kind of funny. You get to hear Dennis Rodman look directly into the camera and say, Cyber monks. <laughs> right, dude. Like I fucking I even had that written down in my notes. I was like, this is actually cool. Like the set. I was like, the set's really neat looking. Like aside yeah. from all the, the hokiness of it. But <laughs> this is uh towards like the uh climax, if you will, of the movie. Like this is where we start sure. getting into the you know, end game, if you will. The big game at the end of the year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are they still calling it that, Richie? I don't know. I fucking like Like course. XFL did like that was the name of their equivalent of the Super Bowl, right? The big the big ma match or the big game at I, the end of I the year. I think it was like the million dollar game or some bullshit like that. I and, and the sad <laughs> thing is I was I was at the fucking XFL championship this year in San Antonio and I think they just called it the XFL championship. And I was like, okay. Right on. Way to differentiate yourself, but you know. Okay. So, yeah. So we're yeah, at, <laughs> yeah. So we're at the we're at the double team big game of the year, and sure. it's it's them kind of like sneaking through the back end of the. Uh, I don't even know what the hell you really call it, but they're sneaking through the back end of like the uh, the monk caves, if you will. And uh, there's a really weird dialogue where Rodman mentions his lucky plastic explosive, like he's taking all these weapons out. And they're they're going to blow up this wall to get through uh, to get to the hospital. And he's out of wire. He's like, oh, no, we're out of wire. And, you know, instead of using a striking rock, because there's no striking rock, he finds the skulls. Because at one point it's mentioned, like, some of these skeletons and skulls there are from, like, ancestors that have died. And they're just there. And he looks at Robin and he's just like, you don't mind, do you? 
And it's like Robin, uh, Robin looks at Van Damme. He's like, you don't mind, do you? And he's like, what? <laughs> he fucking lobs a skull to try to spark this wire for the explosive and misses. And he's like, oh, air ball. And Van Damme's like, you need to practice. And he's like, I hate practice, but I never miss twice, brother. And he fucking gets it this time and blows the shit up. And just just it, the basketball dialogue is, is so yeah, bad. The, I sent, I sent uh, Richie a clip of a YouTuber, Wings of Redemption, uh, <laughs> slamming his controller on his desk. <laughs> like, Man, I can't take this shit no more. <laughs> Is this the point of the movie? For you? That, was, that was the point. <laughs> See, folks, like, I haven't been on the show before, but just full disclosure, I have a very low tolerance for puns. I make them on accident, and usually I'm quick to catch up on, I'm like, to catch it, and pull it back like prevent people from laughing at it because i'm like motherfucker that wasn't my intent that was a slip of the tongue it happened we could move on <laughs> but this was the part I can't take this shit no more <laughs> <laughs> which is but, why i'm so happy you agreed to come on here because we almost have nothing but those sometimes that's like all of ron and style <laughs> <laughs> I, I lasted a while, man. I, I I held it together for a while, but but you 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 needed to know that that's that's where I was at watching this. Play. To be very fair, so was I. I was like, God damn it! On a weird <laughs> weird connection here, very very loose, but just worth pointing out. Um, I made a reference to Hard Boil earlier in the episode, folks. Yeah. I don't know if you if you didn't get it. Um, this moment actually is kind of a replay from a sequence preceding the finale of hard boiled where they're they're kind of trapped and they need to r- jerry rig a explosive device to escape a, a sticky situation only difference is there's like dialogue and character building that happens during that lull in the action whereas here it's just fucking two basketball puns back to back <laughs> don't waste my motherfucking time movie <laughs> i wasted film on that shit dude <laughs> You think, you think Choi Hark like pulled his face out of the viewfinder and just like, oh god, what have I done? <laughs> I need to sit down. He fucking pulls his fucking glasses off. He just, oh, god, god damn it! Like, just face palms. <laughs> Two days to retire. Yeah. <laughs> These dailies suck. <laughs> yeah. So they get to the hospital. And it's it's funny as fuck to watch Dennis Rodman be tall and lanky in a suit and fight. He he looks awkward, but he's throwing like, you know, he's throwing out like legitimate moves and shit. So it's passable on camera. But I can't help but think that is also editing trickery to help us believe that Rodman could kick your ass like this. And uh, he basically like holds off the fort while Quinn finds his wife and she's given birth already unbeknownst to him like at first. This is the scene where he's just like, we talked about this before we went on to air. He just, he rolls up to her. He leans over. He's, what is going on? What's going on? <laughs> it doesn't you know get old. In particular? <laughs> I don't Not know what hello. this, I don't know what Not this movie is. I love is. you. Yeah. Yeah. I miss you. Yeah. What's going on? That's the first thing I thought too, because I was like, "Oh my god!" If I was away from like my, my wife for that long, and she thought I was dead, that's the first thing would be you know, coming out of my mouth. I'm sorry. I love you. I missed you. Like every fucking thing other than what's going on. I d- what I the d- fuck did you do wrong? <laughs> what did you do? Why am I in this movie? <laughs> it was all your fault. Exactly. You your damn sculptures. <laughs> your cow. Because doesn't this he call one. it a cow? Yeah, he calls it a cow. <laughs> oh yeah, forgot important dialogue from that scene at the pool. Your swan is beautiful. You're beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's uh, like, are you talking about my like between my legs or what? <laughs> like, is this some innuendo uh, shit? Uh, I can't God. tell. <laughs> oh. But that was his delivery. Your swan is beautiful. <laughs> and then he gets, you know, he's not angry with her, but. Like the way it's shot and the way it looks, it looks like he's pissed off with her after a second because he's just like, Stavros, where is he? And then he karate kicks the shit out of some some shit that's on this table. He's like, where's my son? Like he's just, and it's like he's yelling at her. It's like, dude, she, fuck, come on. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on? Where's Stavros? Where's my son? 
oh, I guess I love you, by the way. Fucking leaves. Like, dude. And I want to say that. Fucking Belgian Batman. Where is he? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And I don't think we see her for the rest of the movie after this. Yeah, she's gone. How fucking oddball is that? Like, he's there, but he just leaves her again. You know, uh, I mean, Yaz kind of shows up and, you know, he's looking after the baby and her and whenever they eventually come across the baby, which he um, is in the middle of an amphitheater, the baby in question. And so is Stavros. And the baby is um, surrounded by landmines that he's marked off with all these crosses and all this other bullshit. And then there, um, there's a tiger, Tony the tiger from earlier, the one with the pin in it. Comes back with the pin still in it somehow because it's really pissed off. Oh, yeah. It's quite ornery. And uh, some, I don't know. I'm pretty sure you saw this too, but there's, um, during the dialogue between Quinn and Stavros, there's some odd camera shutter speed choices that happen in one of the close ups when they're standing next to each other. I was like, why? That's a really weird stylistic choice. Yeah. They do like a cross fade between the two of them, which is standard practice for like an action movie, especially, I don't know, this kind of action movie. Like, this was the kind of shit you'd see in like every John Woo movie that he likes to have his hero and villain be like reflections of each other in some way. But the shutter speed stuff, again, I have the sneaking suspicion that Mickey Rourke was not making himself available for a lot of of this movie. So they probably had to work around that. That's just a guess. I have no evidence to back that other than the nature of the man (laughs) and this period of his career. Um, I think this was, a few years after his his uh his boxing like he he went back into boxing for a few years like in the early 90s and then his return to cinema wasn't spectacular but yeah i, I want to say that the shutter speed thing might have something to do with it but the setup to this this action finale is unfortunate because on paper it is like the most melodramatic and over the top shit you can imagine the payoff doesn't quite get there but just the amount of moving parts involved and the fucking fact that it's supposed to be staged in the Roman Colosseum right. is so over the top and, and spectacular. That's like, you know, I'm glad this exists in a film. Like somebody went to the trouble to do it. I just wish it was a better film and I wish it was executed better. Yeah. And I, I feel like um, I forgot to mention way earlier in the initial shootout that Stavros's son and wife are killed in this action. So this is why he's got even more of a vendetta against uh, Quinn's character and why he has like kidnapped his wife and his child and all this other shit. It's like, he's going to raise the kid as his own. Cause he got his six year old son taken from him. And it's like, okay, like an attempt to make uh, Stavros a little more humanistic. And um, I don't want to use the term sympathetic because like he's, He's pretty fucking vile, you know, as a person. But that's basically what the hesitance was from Jack Quinn, because he knew that they could be casualties and they wound up becoming casualties. Mm -hmm. So that kind of makes this scene a little more uh, higher stakes for Quinn's part, because it's like, okay, my kid's in the middle of this fucking amphitheater with fucking landmines and and Tony the Tiger is here. Great. You know, he's like, I got to fucking get out of this situation. Oh, yeah. And and earlier in the film, it was proven the tiger sides with Mickey Rourke. Like they have an alliance. Absolutely. <laughs> the mega powers have not yet imploded. <laughs> no, but they, they are about to shortly. <laughs> they are about to. And they in are. spectacular fashion. They are because somebody <laughs> pissed in the frosted flakes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Yaz uh, rolls in there on a motorcycle and picks up the baby who is in the little carrier and he leaves and Quinn is going to escape the tiger to go after Stavros, who has taken off. And he literally we, kicks that tiger in the ass, by the way. Yes, he does. And look, <laughs> we get to the part in question from earlier where you were uh, talking about the, the tiger being asked to do a stunt that it probably was actually not asked to fucking do. And if it was asked, he was like, no. And then they were like, no, fuck you. You're doing it anyway, because this is the 90s and we don't have much more regulation over uh, animal, you know, monitoring on set, probably. And yeah, so. The tiger backs Quinn up to what, you know, he could fall off and, you know, perish. Absolutely. Because it's pretty fucking high up. Meanwhile, he's being like sniped at or shot at from below by another henchman. 
Somebody is shooting him. And <laughs> some motherfucker. I'm telling you, dude, it's, it's like, who the fuck are these people? Uh, he he winds up kicking a board out from under the tiger and the tiger falls like through it. And I'm like, oh, they're going to really kill this fucking tiger like this. Like, I thought they were going to kill him. But then when he's down there, the tiger rolls in and just mauls the fuck out of the dude that's trying to shoot him. It's like, OK, uh, I guess that's why the tiger existed is to save the day where this happens. But. Well, it's it's a comic book superhero rules 101. Like first we fight, then we make friends. Yeah. So he 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 bested the tiger and thus earned the tiger's respect. It, in this in this mega powers analogy, is is Van Damme the Lisbeth of the group? I have to feel like it is. There, there's no way it's not. The, 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 and that makes uh, Tony, uh, I guess Hulk Hogan in a way, yeah. which is fucking weird. And uh, Tony the Tiger, by the way, uh, Rourke. You know, how apropos Mm -hmm. Rourke playing the wrestler in the wrestler is Randy Randy the Ram Robinson and is the Randy Savage of this equation. So, yeah, yeah, we're we're good podcasters, Richie. I try. We we just we just made that shit up. Yeah, we just made that shit up. (laughs) We should have written this movie. better movie yeah <laughs> yeah we have a lot more elbow drops that's for sure uh, fuck yeah we can just call it tag team, <laughs> so tag, team. tag team yeah dude <laughs> yeah make it happen that's it <laughs> fuck so the dude gets mauled by the tiger and then yaz is guarding the baby while quinn and stavros start fighting in the minefield and the first thing that came to mind was i am going to kick that son of a bitch stavros ass <laughs> like just Fucking guile versus it, it's right up there with with uh, pick up your silk underwears and get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> that was his version of I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. Yeah, bites them. You're off the air. <laughs> 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 totally not three different ADR sessions combined into one line. <laughs> that is such a wonderfully bad movie too. I I unironically enjoy Street Fighter for a multitude of reasons, and uh, Van Damme is one of them because it's just yeah. God damn it. I mean, that that was the height of the Coke days. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, that was also the height of his box office success. So that that makes some sense. But I I had issues with it when I was a little kid. But as an adult, I also have grown to love that movie. Same. Uh, It's it's very, very, very tongue in cheek. And I think as an adult, like like removed from the hype train, it works pretty well. Yep. So it's a good even from 1994. It's a good homage to 80s action. Completely. It's G.I. Joe, the movie, just yeah. with Street Fighter iconography instead. Yep. So uh, Yaz has come into play and he steps on a mine, you know, and the whole time Stavros has been telling Quinn, yeah, you can step on the mine just fine, but stepping off of it's the problem. So it looks like Yaz like bends down and like rigs the mine where it's not going to blow up. And unbeknownst to us, he's uh, switched the markers around. You, you don't see this happen, but it's yeah, when exactly. <laughs> yeah. And how did he do that in the midst of neither of them seeing him do this shit unless he did it while he was, you know, in there by himself. Yeah. Speaking of things that we didn't see, Rodman lost a shirt uh, about halfway through this action. Scene. Sure. Like did. He, he arrives shirt shirted on a bike. He puts the baby away. The remainder of the scene is like, oh, apparently it got hot or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I got it. He's got to show off the ink work and all the all the all the shit, dude. I bet you that was it. (laughs) This is like I got some new ink in like during filming. I got to show it off. Right. And then like the fact that they uh, the way he's introduced is he's getting tattooed and it's it's a tattoo that's already pre-existing. But, you know, they're acting like they tattooed this on him and shit. So, yeah, I mean, this was kind of his brand, you know, like Mm -hmm. this was this was what casual like people casually familiar with Dennis Rodman, like maybe even people who didn't know him through basketball. It's like, this is the presence he had in, in just pop culture and media during this time period. For sure. I was, a uh, I was a fan of his uh, basketball stuff. Honestly. Um, I was, I watched basketball like during the nineties. I mean, a lot of us did, but like, I actually like, I played basketball. I watched basketball. So I was, I was a fan. Uh, it was, he, it was special in, in that time period. Cause I, I haven't kept up with it, but that, that decade was kind of special. Like, like me and my brother and everybody around us seemingly was just enamored with the sport. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the equivalent of, uh, honestly, it's the equivalent of Tony Hawk attracting people to professional skateboarding. You know, I, I think, yeah. 
Uh, Tony Hawk is the Michael Jordan of that sport. And uh, Rodman was my favorite. I loved, you know, Pippen and Jordan, but Rodman was the guy that I looked at because he was expressive and he was himself and he was unabashed about being himself. And it's like, mm-hmm. fucking A, dude. Like, because in the 90s, that was a big deal to just be out and be yourself. So, yeah, no, he was his personality and the way he the way he exhibited himself in public was very novel at the time Mm -hmm. Uh, very very atypical especially of athletes Mm -hmm. um in that sport in particular but that was also the time when that sport was physical in a different way (laughs) absolutely uh, he he excelled at (laughs) yeah he i and which is it goes back to the whole line of uh quinn saying oh you 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 play defense because rodman was known as a very great defensive basketball player the rebound, mm-hmm. the rebound king at the time, even. Mm-hmm. But uh, to get back to the whole mind tripping situation, he rigs this mine, leaves it, and then Stavros winds up stepping on a mine. And in a way, Rodman kind of gives him the "Who's the bitch now?" line. You know, "Who's the bitch now?" Because he's <laughs> he's kind of fucked. Someone's closer. Exactly. <laughs> Someone's closer. <laughs> And one of the guys from the uh, colony who has been tracking Quinn this whole time finds the baby in a really weird like pickup shot where he's just holding the kid. Yeah. And uh, he and uh, Yaz take the kid and they run away. And Quinn pretty much tells him to go fuck himself, leaves. And Tony the Tiger winds up dying a fiery explosive death because he charges at Stavros and you see the look in his face that he's relying. He's like, I'm fucked. I'm going to die. So he just, he willingly takes his foot off the uh, bomb as to avoid being mauled. He just wants to go out in a blaze of glory. And the entire Roman colony blows the fuck up. Uh, They they take shelter behind a Coke machine and and probably one of the uh, worst CG shots in the film. It surprisingly looks decent, but you can tell it's dated as fuck. It's Indiana Jones quality of um him being in the refrigerator and surviving that fucking mess of an explosion (laughs) it's like this coke machine (laughs) saved our ass it's ice cold enough that we can avoid the heat (laughs) it's so cold it fought back the fiery flames (laughs) of a gigantic explosion it fought back the roman flames of death it's like fuck (laughs) dude it's like, fuck Gandalf, just choke, chuck a Coke can at the Balrog and you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Better yet, he'd probably catch it, open it, take a swig, and be like, we're cool. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's the most delicious beverage we've ever had. <laughs> That's where he has to turn and break the fourth wall and take a sip with the fucking, like, tooth ding, too, and everything. <laughs> For some reason, at, like my wires got crossed and the fucking Mentos jingle was playing on my head the whole time. <laughs> and, and again, if you see, I know you've seen it, the fucking uh, the Mentos, the Fresh Maker uh, commercial they made out of the Bloodsport thing where they were chasing yes. him. <laughs> so good. That's so great. Oh my God. Run but it yeah, back. <laughs> this whole sequence is, it's kind of glorious. Just like if, if you went frame by frame on this, you could probably teach a college course on the execution of this. It's not good. It's just when you take in all that is happening, it's like, wow, that's a lot. And, yeah. and also it helps that Mickey Rourke is selling the hell out of the material where he does this. He's he's the spoiler where he shows up and he does the, he does some of that acting shit, especially when you don't ask him to. Because there's that bit in the Expendables and that first one where he kind of does stuff, where he says things, where it's him delivering, I think, an improvised monologue to Stallone, who's just kind of standing there and saying, yeah, man, that's dark. Wow. That, whoa, that's nuts. <laughs> and it just keeps cutting back and forth between Mickey Rourke telling the saddest fucking story that's ever been told and Stallone being like, wow, tough break, man. <laughs> like... <laughs> And then I think the I think it was like the thin red line. He doesn't even exist in the finished cut of the movie, but apparently he was on set for weeks or some shit. And he like really poured his heart out. And this movie, him stepping on that landmine and his face acting where you can see you can see the emotions washing over him. He's like, oh, no. Yeah, it's the end. My son is dead. 
I'm going to be dead. Yeah. <laughs> I lost. I didn't get revenge. Oh no, there's a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it. We're going to hell tonight, tiger. <laughs> you and me together. <laughs> and then the image of the tiger leaping at him. Yeah. And very nearly getting its claws into him. Just as the fire comes up. Straight between his legs, by the way. That yeah. explosive went directly into his pelvis. <laughs> 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 that, that, that's a punchline at the end of the movie. The, the building's burning, and then there's a whomp in the background. <laughs> and it's just Mickey Rourke with a giant hole in his garage being like, oh, God, I survived. <laughs> he just has a really high-pitched squeak to his voice, too. <laughs> I didn't mean for this to happen. <laughs> Like I'm, I'm just too tough. I'm just too tough for Hollywood, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, that poor goddamn tiger shit. Yeah, but the 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 advertising magic though. Again, Coca Cola, a can of Coke, enabled Van Damme to execute the most acrobatic kick in the entire film. A can, a Coke vending machine, a row of Coke vending machines, was all that separated all of our heroes and certain doom. Coke for the win, man. <laughs> Always Coca Cola. Always, yeah. <laughs> always be coking. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. So the, the last bit of notes that I have for this, because the way the movie ends is kind of what the fuck too. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> first of all, that baby probably shit itself several fucking times over. Uh, oh, that baby's deaf. Yeah. That baby's sunburned at the very least. Yeah. He, yeah. He's going to have, <laughs> he's going to have issues. He didn't have a hat. <laughs> nothing. No, nothing. It's nighttime, but he still needed sunscreen from all the fucking heat and shit. Uh, the the assassin's name that showed up, his name is Goldsmith or Goldsmith. And Belloc. Yeah, he shows Ivan up. Ooze. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> fucking shows up and he just points a gun at him. And he's after helping them, he's just like, I need a piece of your shirt and a lock of your hair to show that I tracked you successfully. So he's going to let him go. It's kind of like that whole, like, I need to know that like, I need them to know you fucking may have been tracked or whatever. It's like, he's going to let him go. Yaz fucking flips an explosive coin to the ground that it's just a smoke bomb. Mm -hmm. And Quinn leaves with the baby. And I, I'm hoping he goes to get his fucking wife instead of just leaving her ass there. Uh, no, Van Damme drove to the airport. Yeah. He's like, like, fuck my life. <laughs> he was like, just done with the shoot. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> it's like, it's gone. Uh, then Yaz and uh, Goldsmith have this odd dialogue where they're friendly dialogue and the dude leaves and then Yaz just turns around and looks at all the damage around him and contemplates if they're going to blame him for all the damage to the fucking Coliseum and everywhere else. And then it just goes to credits. Yeah. The and fuck? a song sung, sung by the man himself, uh, yeah. on, like on backup. But I'm curious if that line was like an allusion to like maybe his reputation in basketball. Like get getting into scuffles and being a being kind of rowdy, I guess. Probably. I don't know, but I, I'm surprised he didn't like ask Goldsmith. Like, so like you didn't do what they told you to do. Like you're dead, right? Like they're gonna kill you, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I'm okay with it though. Bye, <laughs> goodbye. The movie. Yeah, bye. <laughs> <It> just leaves. <laughs> I need to go pick a fight with some teenagers, some multi ethnic. Teenagers. Yeah, <laughs> fucker. Yeah, that's Double Team from 1997. Jesus Christ, what um, what what a fucking movie. Uh, and I don't say that happily. It's just what what a movie. It's a it, yeah, it certainly was a movie. Yeah, I I had not rewatched this one in a very long time, and it did not get better. I'll just say that much. Yeah, I don't think I've seen this since it came out. Like I saw it the three times that I've watched it over the last day and a half, and then I, the one time before. And I feel like the appeal of doing this was that I knew it was like, I remembered it being, you know, even as a kid watching this, I was like, this is pretty fucking bad. <laughs> and I was like, this fits our wheelhouse perfectly. Let's fucking do it. <laughs> so. Well, the, the one thing I'll say about it is that it is, it's bad. Like it, it's borderline income comprehensible, yeah. especially in its second half, but it's peculiarities make it for me. Yep. Where it's like that's usually the separation between like a straight bad viewing experience and like good bad where it's like this is bad in a way that makes me think like makes me curious as to like why the decisions were made the way they were so it's never it's never like completely boring if you're if you're dialed in a little bit 
it's it's not good a absolutely not don't it's be looking for quality entertainment but at least it's funky like it's odd. yeah it's it's quirky enough that you kind of get a little bit of entertainment out of it you know even though it's not the entertainment that the filmmakers or the actors intended you're still entertained nonetheless and that's that's kind of what we do here obviously like if you're listening to our show that's kind of what we do on cult cinema saturday because um it's a lot of these movies uh are popcorn films they're fun to just like roast with your friends in a you know in a room setting with like beer or like you know food or whatever the fuck you do and you know some of these are underappreciated as well some some of the films we cover on this uh this series are vastly underappreciated and are actually good you know just because a movie is bad doesn't qualify it as a cult you know cult film but like this does have like a bad movie following <laughs> to a lot of folks <laughs> and it's it definitely lives up to that hype if anything yeah, and and these kinds of discussions are always a lot of fun for me because it, it like prompts you to like make something of the experience. Because like really, if, if Richie and I chose to be lazy here, we could just say, "Oh, it fucking sucks." It's like, and that's the whole episode. Or, <laughs> yeah, and that would be wildly entertaining, I'm sure. But you know, the the fun factor comes in digging a little deeper, finding f just finding what whatever to dig into and and talk about. And clearly, we found quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, I love to laugh at shit like this, and you know, I like to laugh with it and at it at the same time. It's good yeah, stuff. I mean, personally, it's like I I just love the medium. Like, if it's a film, I'll find a way to I'll find a way to make it work for me, even if it's complete dog shit. Same. So if anybody out there would like to go hang out with Trevor on catching up on cinema, we are going to have all of the links to their show in the show notes below. You can just scroll up and click it and go subscribe and go give them a listen. There is literally something for everybody. They have covered a ton of films over like the amount of time they've been doing it. I listen as often as I possibly can during my work route because it gets me through the fucking day because they cover shit that I grew up watching and they grew up watching. And it's just, it's a good time. If you want to have like deep dive discussions, like, this is your place to fucking go. And it's a lot to do with how we did it, but some of the movies they talk about are way fucking better than the shit we talk about here. <laughs> hey, we've covered a lot of familiar territory, though. Like, Maximum Overdrive was actually a very fun episode. It was a fun review for a movie that has some issues. It's not the best executed film, but speaking of uh, coke-fueled productions, um, <laughs> so, I mean, Van Damme is an instance of a coke-fueled actor. Maximum Overdrive is an instance of a coke-fueled production. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what we were discussing when we did our episode on that one recently. It was just like, God damn, dude. Like, Devin even brought this point up. He was just like, what made you decide this was the work you had to do yourself? Like out of all the shit you've done, he even references he's like, you know, it couldn't have been just like, you know what? I'm going to do Salem's lot myself. He was like, what made you go trucks? This is the one, <laughs> you know, like what made you go fucking <laughs> trucks? And in a way, I I'm still kinda, don't have an answer. Right. But in a way, I'm kind of glad it was trucks because he didn't, he didn't fuck up something that's a little bit better and not saying trucks is a terrible story, but like, holy fuck, it's very odd. Like out of a lot of the works he's done, it's a very odd pick. So meh. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Warts and all. We got it. Fucking A. <laughs> Thank you so much, Richie. I'm, I'm so, I'm like proud of myself. Real life accomplishment shit. I've I've been on Super Media Bros. That's like a big fucking deal. I'm not even kidding, man. It's a big fucking deal to me. I appreciate that, man. We love having anybody on, but I I've been wanting to do an episode with you like here because like the two times I've got to come hang out with you on your show has been a fucking blast, and I knew it wouldn't be any fucking different over here. So anytime yeah, you want I, to come back, <laughs> please please come back any fucking I'll, time. Door is always open. I'm always open to collaborate. Like just always down to talk about stupid shit and. Uh, Th that Beavis and Butthead talk, I was kind of crying laughing at least five or six times over the course of that very long discussion. Same. <laughs> in fact, I'll put, I will put a link to that episode in the show notes below, too. That was a very fun fucking time. So, yeah, I know what I'm listening to tomorrow morning. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Visit SuperMediaBrosPodcast.com for past, present, and future episodes. Check out all the other shows on the Odd Pods Media Network by visiting OddPodsMedia.com. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on social media. Follow Catching Up on Cinema on social media. We'll have all those in the show notes below as well. Uh, huge thanks to Trevor for coming to hang out with me and doing a double team uh, with goddamn Jean-Claude Van Damme. I would love to do more of his material. I think this might actually be, aside from Street Fighter, the only 
Van Damme. I'm sorry. And um, we, we did another one of his uh, Pound of Flesh forever ago. So if you, if you feel like venturing way the fuck back into the double digits of this of this uh, podcast, go listen to those. Uh, however, we have more to come for the rest of the year. So stick around and uh, you'll find something you like. Thanks a lot, man, for hanging out again. Uh, this was a blast. Uh, we'll do this again sometime soon. Looking forward to it. Man. Hell yeah. All right, everybody. This has been Cult Cinema Saturday, Double Team, episode 288. Until next time, I'm Richie. I'm Trevor. Shades on. We're off. <laughs>